Spark ignition engines are going to require some type of electronics or electrical systems to be able to create the spark that we need to ignite the fuel in the cylinder. So what I'm going to do for the next few minutes here is try to help us get our heads wrapped around how these spark ignition systems work. And we're going to start off by looking at the four primary components. So every spark ignition system is going to have these four components in some form somehow. So you're going to have to have a spark plug that's in the cylinder that creates the spark. There's going to be a coil that's going to step up voltages and we'll talk about how that works. It's going to need some type of a switching device and then it's going to need a power source. And once we understand those four components, we'll put that together and talk about how the systems actually work in some different types of systems. So let's start. Spark plug. <clears throat> spark plug is the, again, that's the part that goes into the piston and is creating the spark in the combustion chamber above that piston to ignite the fuel air mixture that's in there. Now your book does a great job of talking about different types of spark plugs and different variations and how the, the numbering system works on a spark plug. And I won't go through all that, but what I want us to do is make sure we understand what the spark plug is doing. So the business end of the spark plug is right out here. And we'll tear these out, pull these out of an engine, we'll have one in our hands and be able to look at it. But this is where the spark is actually going to be created. This is actually inside the cylinder, so these threads from here on out are going to be threaded into typically the head of the engine, the top of the engine, and it goes down into that combustion chamber. So the electricity is going to come from the top of the spark plug here. So this is a big lug. It's a place where we can connect a heavy wire, the spark plug wire to it. The electricity wants to come down through the center of this thing, and there's a big porcelain piece there that isolates this center piece from the outside of it, so it's electrically isolated. So the current comes down here, and it kind of hits a gap here, and so the electricity, the current's going to say, well, I don't want to go any further there because it's an open circuit. It looks like an open switch to them. Now, the other side of this gap is this arm that goes out here. It's connected to these threads. The threads are screwed into the cylinder, and so it is grounded. So that would complete the circuit. So if these two would touch, I could have current flowing through there, but they're not touching. And in fact, this gap here is very critical. So we'll see that in our engines as well, that, that setting that gap and understanding how thick that gap is, is, is very critical to the engine operating correctly. And so we'll use feeler gauges and and so forth to set that gap correctly in there. So that gap is really critical. So the current comes down here, it says I can't go any further until I get a whole bunch of other electrons and a whole bunch of current come down here, pushing, 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 and I get a great big voltage buildup. So when the voltage gets built up high enough, then these current, these electrons are gonna say, okay, I'm gonna jump the gap. And so when they jump that gap, they create a spark. And so it takes a lot of voltage, and I'm going to write this down. So it takes typically about 20,000 volts. That's a lot of voltage. It's high voltage, 20 to 30,000 volts. That's a good number that you want to remember. So when I get like 20,000 volts, that's enough to make these electrons or make the electricity jump that gap. When it jumps that gap, that's a spark and that's going to ignite the fuel. This is very similar to what happens in a welding, in an arc welding type situation where I have a lot of current going from my welding rod to the piece of metal that I'm trying to weld. And I get a very high voltage, that voltage jumps across and it melts the metal essentially. Now in a spark plug it's designed so that we don't want to melt this. Uh, so it's got different metal metallic uh, capacity, metallic makeup, so that it doesn't melt. Um, and we typically don't let that, that spark is not continuous like it would be in a welder. So it's not like this welding arc. But it's the same kind of concept. Very high voltage, makes the current jump a gap, creates a spark, and that's what, what ignites the fuel. Now, 20,000 volts. How in the world do I get 20,000 volts? And that's where the coil comes in. So, you know, typically our automobiles and stuff like that, you have a 12 volt battery in there. How do I get 20,000 volts from 12 volts? Well, here we go. Going to do a little bit of a physics lesson and talk about some physics. So we're going to have a thing. The second primary component of a spark ignition system is a coil. So we got to have some type of a coil that's going to step up the voltage. So a coil can be thought of as a transformer. It's kind of a form of a transformer. So that's what it's doing. It's stepping up voltage. All right. So what do you mean stepping up voltage? What's happening? Ugh. Okay. 
So let's think about it. Here's some physics. So I got a piece of wire here. So I'll take this white wire that we can see pretty easy. So there's just a piece of wire. I just stripped it out. So what happens with wire? And this is a physics lesson. Anytime I have current flowing through a wire, it's going to create a magnetic field around that wire. That's physics. It's a physics principle. Now, we often talk about the right-hand rule. So if you use your right hand and use your thumb pointing in the direction of current flow, so if the current is flowing as you're looking at this from left to right, if I point my thumb in the direction that that current is flowing, my fingers show the direction of the magnetic field. So what this means is if the current is flowing away from you, I'm going to have a magnetic field as you're looking at it going clockwise around that wire. Okay, so it's just physics. That's what happens. If I get current flowing through the wire, I'm going to have a magnetic field. Ah, okay, so magnetic fields, that's magnetism, current and magnetics. But uh, transformers, how does that get in a voltage up? Well, let's keep going. So if you look at this, I've taken this wire and I've basically coiled it up. So I've made take this wire and just made it into a coil. And there's not very many coils here. There's a few coils. But now let's think about what's happening with that magnetic field. That magnetic field, that, that current's coming down through, and it's going around these wires. So every one of these wires, as it's coming around, is going in a certain direction. So if that current is going in one direction, the magnetic field is going around that wire. So now think about the next loop down. The current's going in the same direction, and I have that magnetic field. The next loop down, same direction, magnetic field. What happens is I get all these magnetic fields kind of adding up. By the way, this is the way we can create an electromagnet. So if I have a coil like this, current flowing through it, and I have it arranged in the right way, all these little magnetic fields, there's not much on each individual wire, but when I put hundreds and hundreds of loops in there, now I've got a pretty significant amount of magnetic field. They add up, and that makes an electromagnet. I can pick things up. I can use them as solenoid valves and, 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 and solenoid switches and stuff like that. So that's how that works. It creates that magnetic field, okay? So so you with me so far? You gotta stay with me. So magnetic field, all this coil, so I got this magnetic field going on there. Now, a couple things that are gonna happen, a couple physical principles. Let's think about this. So if current going through this wire makes a magnetic field, creates a magnetic field, what happens if I put a magnetic field around another wire? So if I have another wire and I have a magnet and I put a magnetic field around this wire, what's that going to do? That's going to make current flow through this wire. Okay? So I can put current flow through, create the magnetic field, or I can take a magnetic field, put it a across a wire, and that's going to make current flow through that wire. So now look what I've got. I've got two different coils of wire, white one and this copper one. All right? So I'm going to take these two coils and I'm going to put them together like this. So I'm going to stick them like that. So I've got current. I'm going to force current to flow through this white wire. The white wire is going to coil around, coil around, create this magnetic field. But now I've got this copper wire in there right beside all that. So that magnetic field that I've created with the white wire is actually going to affect what goes on in the copper wire. And that's going to make a current flow through that copper wire. But here's the cool thing. So I can actually make current flow without any really physical connection. So there's no electrical connection between these two. I should have insulation on both of these wires. I put them together like that. And it's just the magnetic field that transfers the energy, that transfers that electrical power, makes the current flow through that other coil. So now here's the cool thing. So there's more coils in this copper one than there is in this white one. So if I have the same magnetic field, and that magnetic field is working on more of these coils, I can have a different amount of current and a different amount of voltage flowing in each one of those. And so that's what the transformer or the coil actually does. And you can see the cutaway of this coil right in here. We have what we say a, call a primary coil and a secondary coil. A primary coil on this one is on the outside. It's got bigger wires. It's heavier wires. And there's not as many loops of it. The secondary coil's got smaller wires. And it's got a lot more loops, you know, like maybe a 100 times more loops. So what that can do is take this current that's, that's flowing through there, creating a certain amount of voltage, maybe my 12 volts or whatever, and I multiply that by 10 or 100 or 1,000, whatever that ratio is between those two uh, coils, the number of coils, and now I can have, uh, you know, 
thousands of volts. And so that's one of the things that I do to create the thousand, the, the high voltages to step that up. Okay, so we're using transformers, and that's what the coil is. It's just coils of wire, but two separate coils of wire, a primary and a secondary, and the energy is being transferred with a magnetic field. Now, here's the other thing that happens, and this one's a little harder to get our heads wrapped around, but the other thing that happens with, an, with a coil like this is that it acts like a momentum device in electronic circuits. What do you mean momentum device? Well, you think about a big flywheel. If I've got a big, heavy flywheel, spinning flywheel, and I try to grab a hold of it and stop it, what's going to happen? It's got a lot of energy in it. It's got a lot of momentum. It's going to want to keep on spinning. Well, that kind of happens with a coil of wire in electronics. And again, that's a little harder for us to wrap our heads around and think about, but it's a physics principle. So if I've got inductance here or this coil of wire and current flowing through it, it wants to keep flowing. It kind of gets on its momentum. It builds up the magnetic field. The magnetic fields feed off each other, and so it wants to keep on going. Now, what happens if I shut this off all of a sudden? If I cut the wire or open a switch or something like that and make that current try to stop, what's it going to do? It's going to want to keep on going. It's momentum. It's like a flywheel. It wants to keep on going, so that current's trying to shove down through there. And what it does is builds up a lot of pressure, builds up voltage. That's what the pressure is. The voltage is like pressure in there. So it builds up a big high voltage. Now, a lot of you have probably experienced this. Have you ever been around somewhere with a sound system and somebody unplugs a microphone or a speaker or something like that while it's powered? And you hear a big pop, a very loud pop. So if you unplug or plug in a microphone, sometimes you get a really loud pow in your speaker system. What that is, it's the same physical principle. Those microphones and speakers are just coils of wire. That's how they work. They work based on coils of wire. And if I all of a sudden unplug it, and I had current flowing through that thing, that current wants to keep on going, and it's not happy, so it goes and it builds up a big voltage, and you get this big high voltage, and it makes a big pop in the speaker. So it's this what we call inductive kick. So those two physics principles are going on. One is the coil that's going to step up the voltage, you know, so maybe like a factor of a hundred or something like that in the coil, but then I also open a switch when I've got current flowing through this inductor, through this coil of wire, and that gives me a big spike. So I get a big spike of voltage on one side, and then I've got the the primary to secondary coils transferring and amplifying that voltage and boom all of a sudden I got a really big voltage that's how I can take 12 volts going through a wire turn it off get a big inductive kick amplify it a bunch more by a couple primary and secondary coils together there and I get 20 or 30 thousand volts so that's the principle that's the idea of what's going on okay so Coils can look like a lot of different things in engines. Physically, they can look like uh, different. So this is a common on older style engines. You'd see a big coil like that with a wire coming, one wire coming out of the center of it. This would have to be grounded or connected to the frame of the vehicle somewhere. Your small gas engines are going to have coils that look something like this. And you can kind of see this armature that goes through there. That's like the, the metal core that goes through. The coils are behind this black part here. So there's, there's the armatures go through this piece of metal. This is kind of arced, and what's going to happen is that's going to sit right by the flywheel. Now, again, we can make current if we have magnets going past a wire. And so in the flywheel of my engine, that round flywheel, there's going to be magnets, big powerful magnets in there. And so those magnets, when they go by this coil, they create big high voltages. They create voltages. And then we've got a switching device somewhere else that's going to turn that off. It's going to give me that inductive kick. I'm going to step it up through a primary to a secondary coil and all that. And boom, I get that big high 20,000 volts over and over again. Okay? So I hope that made some sense to you. So I've got this spark plug, first component, that makes the spark, but i got to have a big high voltage. i got to snap that thing at real high voltage. It doesn't have to last very long, but I have to have a big high voltage so that that current jumps that arc in the spark plug. This is how I create the big high voltage is with a transformer. So with a coil, we call it a coil in an engine, and that's what it is coils of wire. So I take that coil, that gives me that big high voltage. But now a key part of that we said was to create this inductive kick. 
I had to be able to turn that current on and off. I have to be able to shut that off. So I have to have some device in there that is going to switch it. And this could be a couple of different things. One of the common things, the easy ones to look at, is a mechanical, what we used to call points. So older engines would have a, what we call a points and condenser system. So the points is basically a switch. And you can kind of see in this animation here that I have a rotating shaft in the middle. This shaft is not round. So it's got lobes on it. It's got high spots and low spots. And as it rotates, one of these high spots is going to come in here and push on the center of this arm. So this is a pivot point down here on this arm. Up here is the connector. That's the switch that opens up. So when that high part comes around, it opens that thing up, and then there's no current can flow. So that's my switching device. That's what will open up. That's what will create that big high voltage jump, that inductive kick in the transformer that gets amplified through the coil, and boom, then I get the big spark through there. So, And this all has to be timed very carefully to the engine. So the rotation of this shaft is going to be connected by a gear or a chain or something to the crankshaft of my engine so that every time that crankshaft comes around or every other time in the case of a four cycle engine I'm going to get that spark this is going to open up at precisely the right time to give me a spark whenever I need it to okay this is what they actually will look like here's an example there's actually two sets of points in here uh, so there's a point right here you can see a pivot point um, this is the, the rotating shaft in the middle, pushes on this little fiber piece there, opens up the point down here. Down here's the other one. So there's the shaft, the rotating point, and here's the points that open up. Okay, so that one's got two sets of points in there. Um, the other thing that's part of this is a condenser. So as you're reading the textbook, they talk about the condenser. A condenser is basically a capacitor, and that's a critical component for these engines. Now, in older engines, this is something that would require some maintenance. So these would have to be changed periodically, the points and condenser. Um, especially if things weren't operating correctly, you'd get some electrical burn on these contact points when they open and close all the time. You get some carbon buildup and some burning there. And then they won't make really good connection for you. So, so those require some, some maintenance, some cleaning periodically, uh, require replacement. They also require some adjustment. So when this is open, that gap has to be a certain distance. If that gap is too much, it's not going to close correctly or it'll close too slowly. And then it, it won't operate correctly. So there's got to be just the right gap in there. So that's something that we adjust with feeler gauges and so forth to be able to get uh, the, the right clearance in there to make sure that that is working. Okay, so this is a mechanical switching device. Um, a lot of our newer engines now use solid state switching devices. So instead of a mechanical switch, they're using a transistor or some type of an electronic component like that uh, to open and close this. Um, it works the same way. You can think of it as a mechanical switch because I can visualize something open and closing. But instead of doing it mechanically, it's a solid state thing. It's electronics. There's no moving parts in there, but it's just electronics that makes the thing turn on and off. So there's a couple different ways that we can do that. Okay, so that's the switching device. We've got the spark plug, we have a coil or transformer, we've got the switching device. What's the other thing that we need is a power source. So where does the power come from? So in automobiles, modern tractors, all that kind of stuff, typically the power comes from a battery. And we recharge that battery with an alternator or a generator, something on the engine, that when the engine is running, it generates electricity and recharges that battery and so the power for the ignition system comes from that battery. Now in small gas engines, uh, especially ones that don't have starters or something on them, then we not don't have that battery power on there so we have to create the power in and of itself. And we go back to this whole magnetism idea, the fact that hey if I make current flow through a wire it creates a magnetic field around that wire, but if I make a magnetic field go past that wire, I can create current in that wire. That's the way generators, that's actually the way this alternator works. There's magnets in there that spin past coils of wire and they make current flow. <clears throat> so that's how we can do it, but we can do that with our spark. And so a lot of our small gas engines and things that don't have batteries will we'll use a magnetic principle like that. Um, so, and we call this a magneto. So this would be a battery system over here. And I'll go ahead and write those down. So this is a battery. And these systems over here are a magneto. <coughs> Again, <clears throat> just an electronic 
magnets passing a coil that creates a pulse of electricity. So in our small gas engines, and we'll see this when we tear it apart, we have a flywheel. The flywheel looks something like this. It has cooling fins on it. <coughs> and then the outsides of that flywheel, we're going to have some magnets. And as those magnets go past this coil, they're going to create that electrical pulse. So I'll be, see it up here in drawings. There's a magnet north-south, north poles on the magnet. <clears throat> as those magnets come past those coils, they're going to induce current flow through there, and then we have some other things going on in the circuit that's going to create that spark at the time that we need it. Okay, So that's in the flywheel that's connected to the crankshaft that's spinning around. That's one way we do that in small gas engines. On some older engines, the magneto was actually geared to the engine. So this is a picture of an old, uh, older antique tractor that had a magneto on it. We have one in the lab that we'll take a look at at some point. But it's got a magneto on the side of it. So it's got the magnets and everything inside there that spin around and they create that electrical pulse. <coughs> so... Two different ways to do that. One's a magneto, one's a battery system, so those are two different sites. So we've got our four sources now, our four key components. <coughs> we've got the spark plug, we've got a coil, we've got a switching device, and then we've got our power source. So in the next video, we're going to kind of put that all together and see how they work, how the systems actually function, how those components function together.